So I'm going to try and talk for about 45 minutes, hopefully not too long. I don't know how much you know about this, so it's going to be very difficult for me to judge whether I'm repeating myself. I'm trying not to repeat what I wrote in this week's Weekly Worker, uh, but some of it is obviously repetitive from that article. I think the importance of Siakal is that it's a break with passivity. It's a break with betrayals. Uh, what people remember from the two-day era and the uh, coup that overthrew Mossadegh isn't simply inside Iran, isn't simply the CIA involvement, the fact that a democratically elected government was overthrown and the Shah returned to power. What they do remember is also the repeated uh, zigzags of the two day party, both before the coup, uh, during the coup, and um, what happened afterwards. Uh, they, uh, we know why they couldn't support Mossadegh na Mossadegh's nationalization. The Soviet Union had quite a strong influence on what the two-day party could decide. But um, their lack of involvement, despite the numerous, the very large trade union organizations they had uh, during uh, the weeks leading up to the coup, is also noted. Uh, the fact that they had an officer corps who could have um, uh, played a part in um, at least averting aspects of the coup wasn't used, and so on. Uh, the period I want to emphasize is immediately after 53. We have a situation where uh, the young officers are released gradually from prison. These are young officers of the party. And yet, we see their inactivity, their passivity. Quite a lot of these people are joining commerce uh, industry. They're becoming ministers even during the short period uh, because they are educated. They are the, uh, if you like, the young, uh, up and coming uh, generation. And um, that's the, the theory behind all this, as far as today is concerned, is survival. Survival is very important. Maintain the cadres. The our day will come type of argument. And this coincides towards the late 60s with obviously what is going on globally in Europe, um, uh, the Vietnam War, the Palestinian struggle, um, everything you can think of. And it is in this aspect that two radical left circles, one led by Masoud Ahmad Zadeh and Paris Bouillon, and another from the former youth movement of today, Bijan Jazani's group, um, uh, join forces um, and um, try and change the scenario. There is a radical left. This radical left is opposed to survival. I've written about it before, but Puyon's book, Against the Theory of Survival, is quite a, if you like, I know now looking back at it, it might not be important, but it was really an earth shattering uh, book for that period. Um, Masoud Ahmad Zadeh's book is uh, uh, Armstrong both strategy and tactic. And I know that now looking back at the guerrilla movement, there are all sorts of criticisms, all sorts of theories. At the time, it was again a rebellion against the status quo, against passivity, against two-day inactivity. These people were influenced by um, aspects of China's Maoism, aspects of guerrillaism, by Che Guevara, by all sorts of events during that period. It is difficult to say that Siakal caused the revolution of 1979, but what I would argue is that we would have faced a very different transfer of power from the Shah to uh, the Islamic State had it not been for uh, the Fed Army, had it not been for the movements at stake. Uh, in 1971 and became uh, the organization of Iranian people's federal guerrillas. Um, aspects of what they have written have been analyzed 
time and time again. And of course, there are those who uh, find a uh, nitpick a bit of it. There are quite a lot of it that has problems. But what I would argue is that for the time, they were uh, very influential amongst the youth, the student movement in particular, amongst the intellectuals, amongst the academics. The support they had wasn't initially, and for quite a long time, not amongst the working class. Uh, but you can say that most of Iran's poets were definitely, and in Iran's senior poets are important. It's a national uh, uh, history, it's our main task. So poem, poets such as uh, Kat Kani, others wrote um, iconic poems about uh, the Fedayin, and this made them more of the popular heroes that uh, had become the story. But of course, there were the negative aspects of this. Uh, one of the most important was the short life of the guerrilla, the short life that still affects quite a lot of the comrades who have survived. Six months was given as the time when uh, someone would survive as a member of organization of Iranian people's fed in guerrillas. Uh, mm -hmm. The secret lives they lived, the, the fact that they lived in houses separated from the rest of society affected their um, judgments, their politics, and so on. Um, but most importantly, they were repressed uh, terribly. So we have um, executions, we have arrests, we have deaths during the operations, but we also have death assassination in prison, as in the case of Biran Jazani, who was clearly killed inside Evin prison, a high security Savak prison. Apparently he was going to escape with six other people and they were all shot. I compare this to the relative freedoms that the clergy uh, uh, had during the Shah's time. It's now, if you listen to them, you think they were always tortured, they were always in prison. Very few of them were in prison. Most of them could survive within the mosques that they teached, they preached, or wherever they were. Khomeini himself, who was probably the most vocal opponent of the Shah, from a very reactionary point of view, I have to stress, both in terms of opposing women's uh, right to vote, but also opposing uh, the land reform. Uh, Khomeini was sent into exile. He wasn't arrested, he wasn't executed. Um, not much happened. The mosque survived, and the Shah himself uh, had quite a um, claim of being a religious man himself. He often presented himself as uh, Allah's uh, representative on earth. He used to uh, pretend that he speaks to various Shia imams. So if you like, the main enemy was the left and the Shah's backers were mainly concerned about the left as we will see during the days of the Iranian revolution. Um, If you like, the, the revolution was uh, predictable in some ways, predictable because the white revolution of the Shah had failed, the land reform had left the peasants penniless, the urban poor um, in the shanty towns of major cities in Iran. Um, the economic boom of the early 70s had been replaced by, um, that was bought because of the price of high price of oil, had uh, given a place to a slump, economic slump. Um, but most importantly, uh, the Shah's own directions weren't very clear. One day he was uh, definitely on the West side. He, uh, occasionally he wanted to show the West that he also has relations with the East. Corruption was very high. Now that the Islamic Republic is quite a corrupt system, people forget how corrupt the Shah's system was. One of his brothers, Olam Reza Pahlavi, was called Miss Prince 15%. This is because for every deal that went through in Iran, he used to get 15% if it went properly. Major capitalists were gaining ground. Uh, the middle classes were already getting squeezed. 
they got far worse now than the Islamic Republic, but uh, they were already uh, getting squeezed. And in some ways, you could say that the divide between the rich and the poor, which exists and has far worse and far more under the Islamic Republic, but that divide had um, a different, uh, um, uh, an additional problem with it. And that additional problem was the issue of um, the way the upper classes looked at the rest of the population. Uh, so a woman with a, a, a chador was considered of lower class, people looked down on her, um, it was considered um, westernization was considered uh, the, if you like, the be all and end all of everything. And people who lived in north of Tehran, people li who lived in the uh, upper uh, uh, upscale uh, areas of uh, various cities, had no idea what was really going on. And of course, the, in the absence of, if you like, two days I had given up struggle, of a left that was um, inevitably under a lot of pressure, but also secretly because it lived in um, secret houses, operated as a guerrilla organization. Um, the clergy benefited from this considerably. They were in a position to um, organize, to mobilize, to use the mosque for all of this. And it was therefore not a major surprise that when the protest became larger, when the protest became uh, nationwide, they could benefit from this. Remember that this period, at this period, quite a large number of the radical left were in prison. They were either had been killed or if they were alive, they were in prison. Or they were fighting abroad, such as the comrade here who was fighting uh, in Palestine. But most of the, uh, if you like the, the, uh, the larger number of people went out in the demonstration. Um, and I think here I want to add a little bit of something that uh, I've only thought about recently, and that is that in looking at the Egyptian revolution, um, uh, someone um, that I listened to quite a bit, Walter Omhurst, uh, talks about uh, anthropology anthropological and traditions of uh, historic value into revolutionary movement. And if you look at the at Iran, that's definitely true. So the Shia religion has quite a lot of stuff that comes from the Sassanid dynasty in terms of martyrdom and so on. Um, and in a way, both the Fadai, but also the revolutionary movement of 78, 79, had quite a lot of the aspects of uh, this, um, if you like, this continuation of um, uh, uh, the era of uh, martyrdom. Why is that? The name itself for the Fadaim stands for that name. But if you look at 77, 78, when the protests started, they follow a cycle. It's a very clear cycle. There are protests. The army shoots the demonstrators. The demonstrators have a funeral where other people are shot. Uh, then there is the seventh day of the death of the person and the 40th day. And on both of those occasions, more people are killed by the army. And that in itself becomes a cycle, this cycle of violence and continuation of, uh, if you like, uh, the protest going on uh, for this round where uh, one 40 day finishes, the next one starts basically. And that has aspects of it can definitely be seen first during the revolutionary period, but I will go further and say even, um, after uh, 1979. 79 itself, therefore, has this um, magical, supposedly, figure in exile, Khomeini, who is surrounded by young technocrats. These technocrats all um, die one way or another. So the, uh, they, uh, they are either killed or um, they are imprisoned, or um, only one of them has survived Banisak. 
the technocrats are the advisors to make Khomeini look acceptable to the ordinary population of Iran. There are uh, unbelievable stories about how this picture appeared in the moon for the lesser educated people, uh, but for the more educated people, there are stories about how he can speak 10 languages, he's an expert in everything and so on. But, and all of these are, of course, fiction. As we found out when he returned to Iran, he could hardly speak Persian. His vocabulary was extremely poor. He couldn't even speak properly in the language that he was supposed to have. His Arabic is terrible from what I can gather. Um, and yet, the, the, without the internet, without Facebook, that image had been created of a leader who could uh, save the country. But there was more to it than that. Remember, this is in the context of the Cold War, where the Soviet Union is the main threat. And even though two days ineffective, the radical left can be a major problem. And, and all the efforts are, when it becomes clear, and the Carter administration took a long time to realize that the Shah couldn't be safe, that the island of stability about which they were talking couldn't be safe. Um, we are seeing a situation where um, they prefer Khomeini as an or the religious movement as opposed to the risk, the danger of a radical left. This radical left is only recently out of prison. Many of them are as amazed by what they hear and they see as the rest of the population. Some of them haven't even been allowed in prison until late 78 to know what is going on in the country. They have some support amongst the working class. They don't have the level of support that uh, uh, I would say um, someone like the uh, sections of two they had in 53, but they do have working class support, mainly through the, the myth, the, the, if you like, the, um, the name through the name of the organization, through the fact that these people were brave, through the fact that these people fought, and so on. Um, we are faced with a situation where, and I know royalists and sections of the left talk of major conspiracies. They say there was a conspiracy where, um, if you like, the, uh, uh, the Americans brought for many to power because Shah was so good. He was such an important man, such a revolutionary man, but um, such an independent of imperialist man. But the reality was that uh, basically for the Americans, the between the choices available, as the Shah was definitely going to be away, to be leading, um, the, the choice was to better, better the uh, religious groups you know than the radical left that can be a danger. And we know this from Heiser's uh, documents. We know this from all the uh, materials that has come up since then. Um, what changed the nature of this revolution were the events of the two days, 11th and 12th of February. And that, change, that changing character of the events was instead of this uh, smooth transfer of power that was planned via um, army giving, um, if you like, the leadership to sections of the clergy, this nationalist government coming to power with Bazargon as the acceptable face of the second, the non clerical side of the religious state. Um, all this was shattered, uh, partly because uh, it coincided with a major demonstration, the anniversary of Siakha, where the Fedayim did get a very large crowd in Tehran University, but also with the fact that, and this is well documented in a book by Bahab Zadeh in English, for Iranians it's very well, well known, but the events that changed, if you like, the character of all this, were the homophiles who were supporters of the Fadoids. And what they did was uh, they uh, actually changed sides, things that we have talked about. 
uh, they changed sides, they supported the revolutionary movement and um, uh, opened um, on the repositories. And that did change the character of the revolution. People actually took arms, right? took arms away. The first task of the new government was to force people to return the guns. That was their um, idea. And all this talk of non-violent revolution, revolutions that happen in velvet colors and blue, purple, green, and so on, are nonsense. Because at the end of the day, no government gives power unless there, there's a smooth transfer of power, um, except when people are armed. And uh, at the end of the day, it was that whole change, the fact that uh, the situation changed overnight, basically, in Tehran and in other major cities, that radicalized, that created that format of a revolutionary situation. Um, immediately, the new government of Bazargan imposed um, a, a, a curfew. Uh, the crowds were told to return to home. And we are in a situation where uh, the new government only wants law and order. And I think here is a period where the left had about three, two, three months. I'm emphasizing the events before the revolution to argue that there, weren't, there wasn't really a question of dual power in terms of the working class taking power. The left was not in that position. The left influenced the events of uh, February 79. The left couldn't have taken power, and even if it did, it would have been um, it would have lost power quite uh, quite quickly. However, it did all it could in, in some ways, despite political weaknesses, but it did what it could in the days and the weeks immediately after the revolution. So if you look at um, immediately after the revolution, I think there are strikes that are continuing and the left is supporting those strikes. The Fado is definitely supported those strikes. There is um, protests on every issue where the religious government is trying to impose its authority. Most importantly, 8th of March 1979, the women's demonstration against enforced hijab. And that's quite a significant, important part of that uh, period. But also, uh, what I have personal memories of um, in an oil refinery south of Tehran, the strike was continuing. I went to a large meeting, probably the largest working class meeting I've ever been in my life. Uh, very uh, radical speeches from the platform, but also the mood of the of a, of a huge audience in the uh, compound of the oil refinery was. Uh, uh, militant and radical. However, as we came out, it was clear that uh, both sides of the road we needed to have protection because Hezbollah was standing on the two sides. Their slogan, Hezbollah, only one party, party of God. And if it wasn't, and they, they had chains and they were threatening us for coming to this demonstration. And um, uh, the only way we could, uh, uh, the, the, we, I was very scared, but the, the only things that saved us were the comrades who were standing on the two sides of this road and stopping these attacks against us. Um, at the same time, I think the left did reasonably, the radical left did reasonably well at the uh, referendum that was, uh, the choice was, do you want the Shah back or do you want the Islamic Republic? And the left boycotted this on the basis that this is a no choice for people. Uh, obviously, people don't want the Shah back two, two and a half months after they overthrown him. So you're not giving a choice. And in that way, I think um, it was uh, the correct thing to do. Um, and I also have uh, very good memories of the demonstration May Day 1979, 
when it was definitely the biggest demonstration of the left I'm, I've ever been to, half a million people. Um, as soon as we go past these, we face the situation where the left is losing uh, track. And it isn't the radical left. What we are facing at this stage is the problems we are seeing with um, the divisions, first of all, amongst the Fadawis, in terms of those who think that the government might have problems, might not be fantastic, but it has, um, if you like, um, um, it has potential to become a progressive government, which is, I think, Moscow's line, that uh, Iran has moved out of the imperialist camp. There are two camps globally, and therefore uh, the movement is in the correct direction. And this is influencing some of the um, leadership of the Fadoris, the majority of the Central Committee, but not the majority of the membership. And it is also influencing every other organization, including the Trotskyist organizations that are tiny, but have moved from Europe to Iran by this stage. Um, and the way that division shows itself is again between those sections who think that the uh, Soviet Union is a, a de degenerated worker state and those who don't have much illusions about the Soviet Union. So you can see this division quite clearly amongst all of these. I must say this is the period, the months after the February 79 revolution are the period where the left has quite a lot of support. It is stopping, it is uh, modernist as opposed to the clerics who are talking of things that people haven't heard for a long time. I know people think that all Iranians are traditionalist Shias, but they weren't even amongst the working classes. There were quite a lot of people who drank, quite a lot of people who didn't uh, say prayers. And so the, the left is seen not just because it's an, it talks of equality, not just because it talks of women's rights, but also because it is seen as a modernist um, approach to the, a revolutionary situation, to a changing situation. And the situation is changing every day. Some people are losing their jobs because capitalists are running away. It's a, um, a, a not life as normal or not life as we know it. And it is in this respect that um, I think um, maybe there are also illusions about the longevity of this support. Um, in my family, myself and one cousin were the only people who were before the revolution on the left and we remained on the left. But, but uh, we could see that even in our circles, people were becoming more sympathetic. Uh, on one occasion, a relative came. Uh, this is a time when the Fedoyim had taken uh, the Savak headquarters, which was the secret police's headquarters, as their main base, March 79, in the north of Tehran. It was quite a good place, lively debates, educational classes going in Bumpa, uh, kind of armed struggle type, uh, how to make a cocktail molotov going in other parts. Um, she came up with uh, her jewelry and gave it to us. It was quite valuable. We didn't, we were very ignorant of <laughs> values, but my mother who did know told me, oh, these are very expensive. And she, I want to give them to the Fedoyim. And uh, we duly took them to uh, uh, Mekade, where the headquarters were. But to my surprise, we weren't the only people bringing expensive gifts to the center. People were genuinely um, offering uh, their financial support, their houses, their, uh, whatever they had. And yet, I think what lacked was any preparation for this situation, any preparation in terms of what do we do when we have half a million people in the street. And more importantly, uh, the fact that there was a lot of um, illusions, confusions 
and I go back to the origins of the Third Army, there was no clear, even in terms of the Soviet Union, this uh, superficial uh, description of the 22nd Congress of the Soviet Union being the sign of betrayal, and Stalin wasn't good either, wasn't sufficient to, uh, if you like, um, secure them from the mistakes that uh, two days Soviet Union, um, the ideologies of uh, peaceful road to so uh, socialism, non-capitalist road to socialism, uh, presented at that stage. And so we did see um, major breaks within political organizations of the left, including the Fed Army. I emphasize that um, in terms of the larger sections of the membership of the organization and the supporters of the organization, there was never much illusion about the Islamic Republic. Uh, history has been written uh, by majority, and therefore there is this illusion that there was no resistance to the policies that they took. That is completely wrong. Um, the opposition to the Islamic Republic lasted at least four years after that including um, at very ex at the expense of people giving their lives for this. Um, I think I've gone through some dates of 79, but for me, the dates that uh, sticks in my mind is uh, June, July 79, when Ayatollah Khomeini uh, declared the Kurdish jihad against the Kurdish people. Now, he had declared no jihad against the US, no jihad against the Shah, yet the entire Kurdish people who had shown resistance, who didn't want to accept the Shia government in power, a Persian Shia government telling them what to do, um, were uh, the victims of this call for jihad. And of course, large numbers of revolutionary guards, youth were being mobilized to go and fight this war the left made the right, the radical left made the right choice to do with the Kurdish people. I think the radical left did stay with strikes in factories. What defeated those strikes, what defeated the strikes of the oil workers, for example, in Tehran refinery, was the fact that the divisions amongst the left, i.e. those who saw an anti-imperialist, be it capitalist government, the Islamic Republic, should be supported as opposed to ultra-left slogans such as uh, call for more power to the councils that had taken shape during the um, uprising and the months before the uprising. Um, and I think um, um, the resistance in Kurdistan itself was, um, for all its problems, for all its mistakes, um, a, a revolutionary act in that it opposed the imposition of this war, this um, the threat of this war onto the um, onto the population. A number of events followed, uh, which again made these these divisions between what I would call the radical left and the reformist left uh, stronger and stronger. The takeover of the American embassy, the hostage taking, which was. Uh, declared as an anti-imperialist act by anyone associated with the reformism, Soviet Union, and these people. Uh, the war uh, with Iraq, where uh, again it was uh, declared um, a it, it was a betrayal to oppose your own government because it was being attacked by Iraq, and the radical left didn't take that position, uh, partly because wars have history, and the history of Iran Iraq war isn't simply Saddam attacking with the call of the US. Iran, by that stage, as we know later, was involved in uh, negotiations and purchasing arms from all sorts of dubious voices, including Israel and the United States. So the, um, the complicated political uh, arguments, the complicated political situation of post-revolutionary Iran only made these divisions 
between the radical left and the reformist left stronger and stronger, at, to a stage where uh, today and Fedorin majority were actually naming members of uh, minority Fedorin or other radical left groups uh, were exposing them to the regime's secret services, um, which I, I presume has happened in other third world countries where contradictions have got harder. But you can imagine that from that those huge protests, those demonstrations um, in that period, what could come out of it? There are problems that, looking back, one can uh, analyze further, and I hope in the discussion we will deal with some of those, including the fact that for, uh, uh, this whole concept of um, a front against dictatorship, which wasn't the position of the Fed on, but became, um, if you like, part of some of the sorts of those who later became majority. The United Front Against Dictatorship was um, anti-class, didn't have class dimensions, and created problems because once you go that way, well, why not support for any later on? Is the, is the dilemma that most people um, came to live with. I also think that um, inevitably during the preparations for the revolutionary periods, there were far too many um, um, actions, operations that separated the revolutionary forces from the society with which they needed to interact, to work with, in order to uh, be to understand the part of their demonstration to elevate the slogans to uh, different levels of politics. And the combination of all these created these divisions in 1979. I think the left did very well, given all these mistakes, given all these uh, problems, to at least survive for those years, but at a very heavy cost. Um, just to give you an indication of um, how many lives were lost. Um, I think of the hundreds of people in the two Kurdish bases that I had the opportunity to work with. Um, there are three, four survivors. Um, I count myself very lucky to be amongst those people. Um, inside the Iranian towns, the repression was far worse. If you were found um, as an uh, activist of the left during the Islamic Republic, you didn't even, it was far worse than, being, than during the Shah, you would definitely not survive. Um, if you were a woman, you were far better off uh, taking your life because it was clear that as a prisoner, the way you would be dealt with would be far worse, and so on. So I don't want to go. <laughs> into any of that. I think I've done my 40 minutes. I give some time to Hemad, if the admin could uh, unmute him, so. Hello? I can't unmute. Uh... I have uh, asked him to unmute. Huh. If yeah, you want, yeah. I've unmuted now. Yes, maybe. yeah, they found me. Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, my song? yes, yeah. okay. Uh, thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm very glad. Uh, to find a chance to participate in this uh, memorandum, the anniversary, uh, 15th anniversary of the Siaka. Thank you very much, my dear comrade Yasmin, that I have a big experience coming with you. 
So I start my uh, speech. The first public admission of support for arms struggle in Iran came before Siakal by several tendency of the left movement, even in the area like Kurdistan. One of them was known Jazanis group and other was known Palestine group led by Paknejad. Shukrula Paknejad talked of the first experience of serious struggle when he was a student in the ranks of the National Front of Iran led by Mossadegh. And also the second National Front dissolution with the extremity of reformist idea in the face of the growing domination of the royal court in Posing political scene as determining factor, he told also during the struggle, after much study, after much talk, after many arrested and imprisonment, and gaining many experience, I came to the practical conclusion that the liberation of the Iranian nation and the humanity can only be achieved under the flag of Marxist Benedict. The ideology of the most depraved masses. Many members of the Fedayan as well as other radical left group in Iran, also aboard like several members of the Iranian Students' Confederation, saw our struggle as an international struggle. That is why I and Ashraf Tehani fought alongside Palestinian or Dufarian or Turkish comrades and others such as and others such as Puran Bazargan of Pekar fought with the Dufarian revolution movement, revolutionary movement. In our own way, we the Iranian new left fighters were committed to a revolutionary Middle East free of reactionary forces and the imperialism. A struggle that is valid today as much as ever before. Thank you very much.